I'm Joe Mutura, and welcome to another episode of Heritage Musicians in Conversation. Today's special guest is James Warren, singer-songwriter and bassist with English pop band The Corgis, who had a really major hit in 1980 with the song Everybody's Gotta Learn Sometime. I hope you enjoyed the interview. With Somebody's Gotta Learn Sometime, I mean, yeah. for me, I think that is to, like, one of the ultimate pop songs. I mean, it's so, uh, there's a simplicity to it, but yet there's also, there's this, like, for example, the chord structure. I mean, um, you know, how you use the, the bass notes going down on the chord. I mean, it starts in yeah. C-sharp minor, and then yeah. it goes to C-sharp minor with a B-flat, and then it goes to F-sharp with the A in the bass. I really love how that's just so effective. Ah, oh, great. Good. Yeah. Well, I, I've been fascinated with all those kind of pop song progressions anyway. So that was my my effort in trying to come up with something like that. Also, I, I couldn't really play the piano. I had a piano in the flat I was living in at the time. So my, my, my ability was very basic. So I had to be very sort of, you know, ploddy trying to find sort of, I mean, in my head, I could hear what I wanted. Then I had to translate it into piano chords. And, um, and also, I, I love kind of jazzy, bluesy piano chords. So there are a couple of moments in Everybody's Got to Learn Sometime where you get those kind of jazzy chords. I need your love and gling, like the sunshine. Or, or, or that sort of part of the song, you know, it was my love of jazzy chords, which I wanted to bring into it. But also, it was, it was a very deliberate attempt to come up with something incredibly simple because... I mean, I think simple songs are, are the hardest to write. And so I, I'd always love songs like Imagine, for example, which were just so simple, but just so powerful. So I, I was trying to come up with something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then the lyrics, I mean, there's only really like four verses. I mean, and I, and I read that that was the first four lines that came to you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So what happened was the original, my original demo was just like, you know, change your heart, look around you. Just those like few words that everyone is familiar with. And I always intended to write another verse because I thought you can't just have one verse of lyrics and repeat them. You, you've got to have a second verse. And so I always intended to write a second verse. But when our record label heard the demo, then they said, yeah, that, that, that's the one. That's the song you've got to work on. That's really got potential, you know. And they wanted, they wanted to be able to release it as soon as possible, basically. And so I did a version with a new second verse of lyrics. The second verse sits on my new version, which mm -hmm. you've heard. Mm -hmm. Sent it to them. And they said, hmm, I don't know. I don't think it's got the same magic. It's, it's the very original demo. Why don't you just, just sing the first verse and repeat it? You know, that, that's, that's magical. So I said, OK. So that's what we did. And, and that's what ended up being, you know, the, the record, you know, that came out as the Corgis. But I, I was always kind of sort of embarrassed by the fact there's only one verse of lyrics. I mean, later on, I sort of said to myself, well, you know, look at it as a kind of Zen song, you know, just something just incredibly straightforward, incredibly simple, just repeated. And, you know, and so I, eventually I thought, well, yeah, OK, that, that's it. That's what it is, really. And, and it works. But when I had the chance to do this re-recording, a sort of 40th anniversary sort of celebration of the song, I thought now is the time to bring in that second verse of lyrics that I always wanted to have in the song. Okay. Um, and the other thing too, you mentioned uh, being like a Zen type thing. Um, I mean, that is sort of got some Buddhist sort of um, lyrical imagery happening there because when yes. you listen to the lyrics, it's very sort of an introspective sort of a song. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because I was really heavily into Buddhism at the time. So it was exactly that. I mean, I, I, think, I, may, I think luckily the song has different sort of layers, possible layers of meaning for different people. And I know that many people have just presumed it was a kind of love song, a kind of, you know, me singing to someone, just one other person. But to me, the original thing of the lyric was, was to be like this, it was a kind of universal kind of Buddhist sort of way of looking at relationships and life, saying, you know, we've got to sort of look with new eyes at how we relate to each other and love is the most important thing, not, not sort of egotistical stuff, you know, that we get wrapped up in. So to me, it was very much a kind of spiritual sort of, you know, Buddhist kind of lyric. Um, now, Dumb White is the album that it, that it came from. Now, that, that's actually classed as one of the uh, pivotal sort of influential albums towards the new romantic 
um, style that came out after you guys, like Duran Duran. I mean, uh, that, that's that's a pretty uh, in, important sort of footnote in, in musical history. I didn't realise that. Oh, you did? No, no, it actually, it's been <laughs> name-checked by a lot of bands, yeah. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it, it was us just sort of messing around in the studio, not, not really having a, a, a game plan or anything or a, a particular direction. I mean, as you can hear, I mean, the, the tracks have got lots of different sort of like, come from different areas, you know. Um, and also it was a bit of a tricky album for me, actually, I must say, because um, Andy, who I was still working with at the time, he and I always had a fractious relationship. We were sort of like as different as chalk and cheese as people, you know. And after a while, we get just we just piss each other off completely. And that's what happened during the making of that album. So he walked out, leaving me to re-sing songs that he was meant to have sung, which were kind of too low for my register. I mean, songs like Perfect Hostess, that's an example, you know. It was a song that he was meant to sing and, and he recorded it, in fact, with him singing. Then he walked out, you know. Um, so I had to re-record it with him because I was the only one left so in the band, so to speak. So I had to sort of re-record it. Uh, and in those days, you, you couldn't just easily retune a track to suit whatever key you wanted to do it in. You know, it was that was what it was, and you had to match your voice to it. So you know, for me, it was a it was a very kind of tricky album. Um, and not wholly satisfying for me personally for that reason. You know, I mean, I, I, I didn't like my voice on some of those songs, but there it was. You know, it was uh, all part of the, the game. Yeah. Um, you, you guys never toured America. Do you think that's part of no. the reason why um, the, the song only sort of reached, I mean, it did peak at number 18, but do you think that yeah. you could have had more success if you actually toured America? Definitely. Yeah, that was a big mistake on our part. In fact, we didn't tour anywhere, would you believe? Because um, at, at the time, there was a new trend in the UK, I don't know if it was the same elsewhere, of, of acts being just studio acts, you know, just being kind of somewhat mysterious, you know, dark glasses sort of studio acts, who just turned out singles, but never appeared live. And we thought that's a great idea because with Stackridge, we'd been touring constantly for like years. And we thought, this is a wonderful idea. We can just stay in the studio all the time, just, just make new recordings. And we don't, we don't have to go on the road anymore. And, uh, but that was a big mistake. As soon as, you know, we had a couple of, we had a, a song before everybody's got to learn called If I Had You, which was a hit in, in England. And that was the moment when we should have gone and started touring, but we didn't. So we, we remained a kind of mysterious band for the general public with no particular profile, you know, and that was a big mistake, I think. Okay. I, sort of, I think a similar thing happened to Jerry Rafferty, I mean, with Baker Street and all this sort of stuff, he just refused yeah. to sort of tour, you know, and everyone looks back and go, well, you know, if you toured America, it could have been even more massive than it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's the case. Yeah, it's a yeah. big mistake. Yeah. Now, with, with the call, I mean, later on, you, you do, so the band did split up, but you've still been ongoing. I mean, um, you've got this new album coming out um, yeah. soon. So just tell me a little bit about this new album. I mean, it's been 32 years since your last one. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The last sort of proper Corgi's album was recorded in, I think it was 1990, 1992. It's called This World's For Everyone. And it's got some really good tracks on that. I, I think it's, it was good, actually. Um, but then, as usual, we sort of drifted apart and everyone did different things. Um, but at that time, I got, I got to meet an Australian guy called Al Steele, who'd started living in England, in Wales, in fact. And he was gonna be, he was gonna play in a live band. We thought now is the time, belatedly, to start doing a live Corgi's band. So we started doing some rehearsals. Uh, we were introduced to Al Steele, a uh, brilliant guitar player. And um, we actually did a couple of gigs with Al, I think, as the Corgis. Uh, but then it sort of fizzled out again for various reasons. But anyway, I got on, I, I thought Al was a lovely bloke and we kept in touch. And then like literally five years ago, seven years ago, um, I, I, I discovered that Al had a studio, a recording studio near Cardiff in Wales. Got in touch with him, we met up again, got on like a house on fire. And we said, well, why don't we, you know, start doing, try and write some stuff together, you know, and start doing stuff, you know, recording stuff. 
And that was the, the, the birth of this Corgis album, really. Me and Al getting together again and writing new stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I mean, since you've been in, the, I mean, since what the, the early, well, late sixties, really. I mean, the, the industry yeah. has gone through so many changes. I mean, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, what's some of the things that sort of stick out for you, and how does it affect has affected you over the last say fifty years? Yeah. Well, it, it's a technology thing, isn't it? it, it mm. it's, it's incredible advances in recording technology and uh, performance technology, like synthesizers and and so on. It's just been absolutely incredible. And it was very exciting in the 80s when we first started the Corgis, actually, because that was really when all the sort of sampling thing started to be available. And uh, there was like, um, I remember at the time, there was this new keyboard, which, which was made in Australia. Actually. Yeah, Fairlight. Fairlight, yes, yes. And at the time, Peter Gabriel, you know, formerly of Genesis, uh, started living in Bath and we met him because he came to the recording studio that we were using for dumb waiters and so on and we got friendly with him and basically he he had one of these fair lights and he let us use it for everybody's got to learn sometime so the the koto that we talked about earlier the Japanese instrument on everybody's got to learn was actually played on the fair light synthesized sampling synth that we borrowed from Peter Gabriel. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, the changes for me that are most significant down the years have definitely been the technology. Yeah. And uh, I, I've embraced it. You know, it's, it's been great fun. You know, uh, it, it's been a, a good development, I think. 